Uh, welcome to our webinar, everyone. Um, our webinar is on breeding sheep to reduce methane emissions. Uh, my name is Grace Whitlow, and I am the knowledge transfer manager in our beef and lamb team here at HTB. I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping rules before I introduce you to today's speakers. Um, this webinar will finish around one o'clock. Uh, it will be recorded. You will be muted throughout the webinar and there are ROSA points available for attending this webinar. If you haven't already submitted your ROSA number when registering for this event, you can send it to us using our knowledge exchange email. Uh, the details for this will be sent to you after this webinar. There will be time for questions at the end of the presentations, and we encourage you to send these across. Uh, guidance on how to do this is on this slide. At the end of this webinar, you'll be invited to leave feedback. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you could take time to do this so that we can improve our webinars in the future. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our two speakers for today's webinar. First up, we have Laura Isles, who is our Signet breeding specialist working within the HTB Fernam team. Laura grew up on a sheep farm in Cornwall and has a strong interest in animal breeding and genetics, having studied animal science at Harper Adams University. She joined the Signet team earlier this year and plays a key role in delivery of the National Sheep and Beef Breeding Evaluations and many other research projects. And secondly, we have our key guest speaker for today, uh, Noirin McHugh, who is from uh, Chegas and is a Senior Research Officer in the Animal and Bioscience Department. Noirin has a PhD in Quantitative Genetics from University College Dublin. Hailing from a sheep farm, she has been working as a sheep and beef geneticist with Checkers since 2011. Her roles include improving the national genetic evaluations for sheep and beef, and her research is industry focused with a direct route to application. Her current projects include investigating the role of genetics in improving greenhouse gas emissions for the Irish sheep industry and validation of the national indexes for sheep and beef. So to kick us off, I will now pass you over to Laura. Thank you, Grace. Um, yeah, I'd just like to take this opportunity to welcome you to today's presentation on breeding sheep to reduce methane emissions. Um, I'm just going to sort of introduce this subject and talk about a little bit about some of the work AHDB has done in this area. So the amount of methane produced per kilogram of lamb sold is an important consideration for farmers and supply chains looking to reduce their environmental footprint. We know that methane is an inevitable um, byproduct from the fermentation process within ruminants to convert forage into meat we can consume. However, this is often on land and unsuited to other forms of food production and the amount produced does vary, and this variation can be exploited through selective breeding programs to lower methane emissions. Arguably, selective breeding is going to be one of the most cost-effective, sustainable, and long-lasting options we have in tackling this challenge. So today we are joined by Dr Noreen McHugh from Chegas, as she talks about the projects in Ireland that have set out to measure methane emissions in Irish sheep flocks. She will explain why this work is important and what impact it is expected to have. So before we get started, I just wanted to highlight that this lunchtime webinar is very much a warm up for the Sheep Breeders Roundtable conference in November. This year it's being held in, in Nottingham and tickets are currently selling fast, but we have a first class lineup of national and international speakers that will be joining us for this three day event. For more information, head across to the AHDB website where you can see the full programme of activities and book your tickets. And if you want any further help with doing this, please do get in contact. So before we head to the main presentation, I'll just give you a little bit of a background to the topic, AHGB's work to date and the impact breeding is already having on the national flock. Most of us will be familiar with the importance of research influencing environmental issues. The UK government has a target to completely negate the amount of greenhouse gases produced by human activity by 2050 and hence the term net zero to be done by reducing emissions and implementing methods of absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. In regards to agriculture, the two biggest sources of this are being the release of nitrous, nitrous oxides from soils, and many of my colleagues within the AHDB 
environmental team have a programme of work around this and more information can also be found on the HDB Knowledge Library. And then we'd move on to the release of methane from livestock production and storage of manures, the former being the focus of today's topic. So up to now, AHGB has been actively engaged in research, looking at ways to quantify and changing levels of methane production in ruminants for many years, often winning co-founding bids to help us to do this work. So back in 2010, the methane inventory highlighted the variation that can be seen between animals in feed intake and its potential role in reducing methane emissions. Also in 2010, the start of a funded PhD assessed the ways to measure methane, a technology that has changed rapidly in the ensuing years, as we will hear shortly. While back in 2012 to 2015, the NutriBrief project touched on the impact of adding feed additives to beef rations. But for beef cattle, the real breakthrough came with the funding of the Beef Feed Efficiency Project. So the Beef Feed Efficiency Project, which has now been running since 2015, is a major piece of work that is currently assessing feed efficiency of beef cattle, as well as looking at elements of meat quality. To date, we have collected over 2,000 records for feed intake, and the aim of this is to deliver, to deliver breeding values for UK beef cattle, and it has shown the incorporation of feed efficiency into breeding indexes for beef cattle could reduce animal feed bills by 12.5 million pounds per year across the industry, while reducing beef-related greenhouse gas emissions by 27% over a 20-year period. If you want to find out more about this project, then head onto the AHDB website and look under Beef Feed Efficiency Programme, or alternatively, contact Natalie McCormack, who is heading up this project. So, sheep may be the greater challenge, but we're already doing a lot of work through genetic selection. Sheep appear to provide greater challenges than cattle, with dietary interventions being much more challenging and being a smaller animal. Sheep provide new technical challenges when it comes to measuring feed efficiency, where equipment has often been built with cattle in mind. The good news is the work of Signet, who currently lead the National Genetic Evaluations for Sheep, and they are already doing, conducting a number of ways of selective breeding and using this to reduce the amount of methane produced by the national flock relative to the amount of lamb it produces. Here are some of the breeding goals with EBVs that influence them listed. So, looking at lifting ewe productivity, the biggest impact we can make is by increasing the number of lambs produced per ewe over her working lifetime. This means selecting sheep that are genetically more prolific, express better lamb survival and have a longer productive life. Reducing adult size. Smaller ewes are found to produce less methane. In fact, low methane producing sheep tend to have a smaller rumen, albeit one with a larger surface area. While selecting for rumen size is challenging, reducing mature size is easy. This trait is highly heritable and easily measured through selection to reduce mature size, must be balanced against requirements to lift lamb growth rates. We're also looking at producing meat more efficiently through the following EBVs. Genetic selection to reduce days to slaughter and, and increase the carcass yield of muscle relative to flat will reduce the amount of methane produced per kilogram of saleable meat. These are traits we can enhance by using rams with high breeding values for both growth and muscle. Results within our Ram Compare project highlight this work using high genetic merits on commercial farms and assessing progeny. We can also look at selecting for parasite resistance and various studies have shown that parasites sheep tend to be higher methane emitters. In maternal breeds selection for greater parasite resistance will continue to reduce greenhouse gases. For more information on any of this work that we currently have talked about, head to the Signet website at signetdata.com. All of these are known to reduce the carbon footprint of sheep, but the ability to measure methane in sheep has the potential to take this work to a whole new level. And with that, I will hand over to Noreen to tell you more. Thank you, Laura.
So yeah, so thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to present to you today. So uh, I'm going to just highlight some of the work that's ongoing in Ireland in conjunction with uh, Sheep Ireland, who are the body responsible for the genetic evaluations that we have ongoing in reducing greenhouse gases, but specifically methane in the national population. So just as a bit of background or a bit of context today, I just will start off with where are we in the Irish sheep sector and what's, what is it like compar comparable to the UK one? So similar to, to the UK, we're very focused on spring lamb production. Our uh, yo population has declined quite dramatically since the late 1990s. Uh, we had approximately um, 8 million yos at one stage, but now we're down at, uh, at just under 3 million breeding yos. 80% of them are in what we call lowland uh, areas and 20% are hill. But as Laura mentioned as well, la most of our yos are on marginal land here in Ireland. There's approximately 35,000 uh, farms that uh, have sheep as part of their enterprise. About half of those specialise in, in sheep only. The average flock size in Ireland is relatively small at 83 yos, but has been ga uh, growing in the last number of years. We're a major exporter uh, of sheep meat here in Ireland. We're over 300% self-sufficient, um, and our ma major exporting areas are France and also the UK. So it's an important industry in rural areas in Ireland, obviously similar to the UK, you know, and in land areas where you know there isn't much alternatives uh, for farming. So that's just to set the context. In terms of where are we at uh, with uh, greenhouse gas emissions in Ireland? So the greenhouse gas emissions in Ireland, agriculture is responsible for about a third, just over a third of it. Uh, and it's the single largest industry when it comes to greenhouse gases um, in Ireland. So that, that and all the press at the minute in, in terms of reducing greenhouse gases, it means that agriculture in general in Ireland gets bad press uh, probably on a daily or weekly basis now um, in where we're at and how, how are we going to address this challenge. If we look specifically at the Irish sheep sector, uh, we're a small part of the overall agriculture greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we account for about 10% of the total greenhouse gas emissions, but pressure is coming on the entire agricultural industry. So sheep needs to play its part in showing that where we're at in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions and where we can get to in the future. So this here, the, the chart that I've displayed here, this is showing the current greenhouse gas emissions that's been estimated based on life cycle assessment by Jonathan Heron here in Chagask. And it's shown that on average, our lowland yo is producing approximately 11 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of live weight. So it's relatively small, like I said, on the grand scheme, scale of things in agriculture, uh, but be that it is may, if you look at this, you can see that enteric fermentation or methane that is produced by the animal uh, accounts for a large amount of our total greenhouse gas emissions from the average yo here in Ireland. So the pressure is coming on to see what we can do in terms specifically of methane emission to reduce this. So just to bring you through, what is this enteric fermentation? Well, enteric fermentation is basically the digestion of food by the sheep to produce methane. So methane it's the second most uh, important greenhouse gas emission that's talked about when it comes to global warming, carbon dioxide being the main one. But the thing with greenhouse green, or with methane in terms of a greenhouse gas, a greenhouse gas, it has a global warming potential of about 28. So it's saying that it's 28 times more potent than CO2, albeit that it lasts lasts a lot less in last for a shorter duration in our atmosphere than CO2. But it is a very potent gas. The other thing to bear in mind when we talk about methane or enteric fermentation, it's an inefficiency in the system in that it's it's energy that the animal isn't using to convert into a product, be it meat in this case. So in other words, that about two to 12% of um, meat or feed energy is lost through the process of enteric fermentation. So what does that process look like? So let's take a sheep here, they're out grazing. They, they, inject, they eat grass, it goes into the, into the rumen or the stomach of the animal, where it is digested by bacteria to produce a number of different molecules. That includes CO2, hydrogen, and volatile fatty acids. And this is basically what's used then to produce your nutrients um, that goes on to grow an animal. 
But at the same time, that CO2 and hydrogen also interacts with what we call methanogens. So these are micro, micro bugs in the, in the actual rumen, and they produce, as you'd expect, methane. Methane then is excreted by the animal in two, in two directions, 90% of it coming out of the air um, of the animal. So like I said before, it's an inefficiency in the system. It's the animal not using that grass that it, ha it has ingested um, to produce a product, be that saleable meat. So anything that we can do to reduce greenhouse gas or specifically methane within the animal, well, that will also improve our efficiency. So it's a win-win when we talk about it in terms of agriculture. So there's lots of mitigation um, strategies that we have available to us at the minute uh, to reduce total greenhouse gas emissions from the Irish sector. So this is um, uh, uh, 10 steps that are available to Irish sheep farmers that has been um, been done in collaboration with the signpost farms here in Chagask. And it, num it, it outlines 10 specific things that can be done on your farm to reduce your greenhouse gas uh, footprint on your flock. So the first things that we can do are management, and I suppose these are what we call the low-hanging fruit. So they are things like improving our grassland management, applying um, protected urea in the form of fertilizer, using uh, the, the correct slurry application, maintaining our soil fertility, and applying lime at the correct times. So simple enough things that can be implemented on farms to reduce our total greenhouse gas emissions. Then breeding, and what I'm going to focus on today, there's a number of strategies that we can take um, to improve our greenhouse gases from the Irish sheep sector. So that includes uh, finishing lambs earlier, because if a lamb goes to slaughter at a younger age, they're producing less methane over their lifetime than one that's slaughtered at a later age. So very easy steps. If we can identify fast growing animals, well then we will automatically reduce our methane emissions straight away. If we reduce the age at first lambing, we have more efficient yews that are producing more product over their lifetime. So again, a win-win. If we improve the quality of the replacements that we're using within the, within the flock and specifically selecting on our indexes, that can help improve our greenhouse gases. Targeting higher proliferacy, both within and across breeds, can also improve this. So there's lots of strategies when it comes to breeding that can help green, improve our greenhouse gases. And the final step that we have identified in Chagask, and probably one of the hardest ones to implement, is the incorporation of clover into the diet um, of sheep. So today, like I said, I'm going to focus mostly on breeding. How can we breed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but specifically methane within, within our flocks? The first thing that we looked at was, well, what are we doing currently? Most of our farmers um, are selecting their rams using Eurostar indexes, so uh, breeding values that we produce here in Ireland. And we have two indexes. We have a terminal index and a replacement index. And we wanted to see, well, what was the impact if a farmer went out and selected an animal that had high genetic merit for these indexes? What was that doing in terms of to profitability of that farm, but also in terms of the greenhouse gas output from that flock? So this is based on a number of um, work that has been done to date. A lot of it is modeling work where we take the data from individual flocks and then we implement it and look in terms of uh, what impact it has on economics or in terms of greenhouse gases. But I suppose to start off with, we wanted to look at real life data, real farm data coming from Irish commercial flocks. So to do this, we used what we call our CPT, our Central Progeny Test Commercial Flocks. So there are a number of about four flocks here in Ireland that uh, lamb down 3,000 yews on average annually, where all the data is recorded on them, right through from lambing to lamb growth rates to slaughter characteristics, etc. So we have a very good profile of these animals both at the performance levels and also at the genetics. So we use that data um, from the results of that, we model two flocks. We model what we call a one star flock. And a one star flock here are animals, a yo and a ram, that were bought into a flock that were very low genetic merit, 20% in within the 20% lowest genetic merit for replacement type traits. They produce lambs. And then in the other end of of the scale, we looked at a five-star flock. So within the five-star flock, again, we had a yo and a ram that were mated. They both had the top genetic lines in terms of our replacement traits, and they went on to produce lambs. Again, remember, this is all coming from real data that's recorded on our commercial flocks. 
And what we saw is that there was big differences between these flocks in terms of if you went out and selected your RAM or your YO on an improved index for their replacement traits versus one that had a lower uh, value for the replacement index. The first big difference we saw was in terms of weaning rate. So in our five-star flock, uh, the average weaning weight was 1.7 lambs weaned per yo. If we look at a one-star flock, they weaned approximately 1.54 lambs weaned per yo. So you can see straight away a big difference there in, in output in terms of the number of lambs you will have to sell at the end of the year. The other big difference we saw between the two flocks was in days to slaughter. So days to slaughter is how we evaluate growth here in Ireland. So how quickly does it take that lamb to finish and to get off to slaughter on your flock? So in the five star flock, it took on average 190 days to finish these lambs to hang them up. Whereas in the one star flock, it was down at 203 days. So not only were the five star flocks producing more lambs, but these lambs were also growing faster for you and getting uh, way to slaughter at an earlier age. And remember, all this is real data coming from commercial flocks here in Ireland. So what we did with this data is we ran it through the model, put in these values, and we wanted to see, well, what impact does this have on the total um, productivity, but also the uh, total economic performance of that flock? And what we saw that there was an 18 euro difference uh, per yo in selecting animals from the five star flock versus selecting animals from the one star flock. So straight away, we're seeing improvements in productivity and also in economics. But like I said, that was only part of the reason we did this. The second part was to look at our greenhouse gas intensity to see, well, what's the difference by selecting on our indexes today? What are we doing to greenhouse gas intensity here in Ireland? And what we're seeing is that there's actually a big difference in terms of the amount of greenhouse gases that are produced per kilogram of product, so that's um, carcass, carcass weight, in terms of your five-star flock, so the high genetic merit flock, versus the one-star. So on average, your five-star flock is producing approximately 22 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of carcass weight produced, whereas your one-star flock is much higher, producing over 23 kilos. And what we're seeing is that there's a 7% reduction in the CO2 equivalents that are produced from your five-star flock compared to your one-star flock. So very good news story in that selecting on your indexes currently, it's improving performance at the flock level, it's improving the economics at the flock level, and it's also improving greenhouse gas intensity at the flock level. So it's a win-win at the minute. But the thing when we talk about greenhouse gas here in Ireland and we talk about the targets that have been laid down by our government, it's total greenhouse gas, gas emissions from our sector, from the sheep or from the agricultural sector. It's not greenhouse gases per unit of product. So in order to, be, to reduce our total greenhouse gas, we really have to select directly uh, for methane emissions when it comes to our agricultural sector. So that's why we really want to measure methane on individual sheep to look at what's the total greenhouse gases that are emitted by different sheep. So we want to identify the high and the low emitters within individual flocks and ultimately to develop a breeding value for methane based on these results. I would say we're not the first country in the world to do this for sheep. New Zealand launched their breeding values for methane emissions back um, a year ago now. So similar to us here in Ireland, New Zealand are coming under massive pressure to reduce greenhouse gases across their entire agricultural sector. So they have led the way really in developing this breeding value for methane. So I think the first thing we need to do when we talk about methane, well, is how do we actually measure it when it comes to sheep? It's not, that, it's not the simplest thing to measure compared to live weight where you can put an animal in a crate, measure them very quick, very quickly and measure lots of animals uh, very rapidly. When it comes to methane, there's a number of different methods we can use to measure it. The gold standard is what we call the respiration chamber. And the respiration chamber for all intents and purposes is a glass box where a sheep is placed for approximately 24 to 48 hours and you get um, uh, you get a profile of the methane emitted from that sheep over that period of time. So it's a very um, 
it's a very thorough measurement of sheep. But the big problem for, for this, for the respiration chamber, is you have to have each animal in this box um, for a 48-hour period. So straight away, you're not going to get lots of measurements on individual sheep very quickly because of the labour and the time associated with it. So when it comes to genetics, we really need thousands upon thousands of records to uh, disentangle what is the effect due to genetics from the effect due to the environment or breed or anything else. So, you know, respiration chamber data, it's going to take a long time to get us up to thousands and thousands of records. But luckily, we have other ways or equipment that we could use to measure methane in sheep. One of them is called the portable accumulation chambers, where uh, it's a spot measurement where sheep is put into the chamber for approximately 50 minutes. And it gives a good prediction of the methane that that sheep will emit over a daily basis. And it's a very useful tool for ranking sheep. So in telling you what's the top versus the, the bottom emitters. And really, that's all we want when it comes to genetics. Other ways we can measure it is using SF6. SF6 is basically you put a backpack on the sheep. Uh, you have a number of wires attached, attached to the sheep right up close to the nose of the sheep and you're measuring the breath of the animal at specific time points across the day. The be beauty of this thing is you can measure the animal in its own environment. It's in the field grazing and you can measure those methane, emitter, methane uh, profiles on those animals. Green feed is another, another device that's widely used to measure meat. Um, mostly in cattle to date. It's basically this, this equipment here that you can put anywhere, again, in, in the field if you want. It, what it does is it uses bait or it uses a small bit of nuts to attract the animal in. Uh, and once the animal is eating uh, the, the meal, it can measure the meat in at the same time point. We haven't tested the green feeds yet in Ireland, but we have test, tested these other methods and we have compared them to the gold standard that was the respiration chamber. And really, re the results from our work has shown that the pack chambers or these portable accumulation chambers are really what we, we are using now to measure large number of animals for our genetic studies. So just to bring you through these packs. So again, they're port portable accumulation chambers. So this is the trailer here. There is 12 individual boxes here, so we can measure 12 animals at the one time point. The animal enters it for approximately a 50 minute period. Um, but the beauty of these, as you can see here, is that they're on a trailer. So we can measure 12 animals um, over an hourly period, but it's also mobile. So we can bring it to farm to farm to measure different um, animals in different environments around the country. So what's the process involved? Well, so when we go out to flocks to measure, we remove the animals from feed approximately one hour prior to entering the chamber. We get the live weight recorded on these animals and we also scan in the tag number so we can link it back um, to the individual animal. We place the animal in these chamber for 50 minutes. It's a completely sealed chamber. So anything that emitted by the animals over that 50 minute period, we can measure. So we have a measurement device that measures methane, CO2 and oxygen consumption um, at specific time points. So we measure it prior to the animal going into the chamber, halfway through and at the 50 minute point to give us a good predictor of methane emissions for these animals over a 50 minute period. So like I said, this is our um, method or equipment we are using widely now in Ireland to start to get a good profile of what methane looks like on our national flock. So what did the results look like? So like I said, we measured them for 50 minutes and what we've done here is we've extrapolated it up to give us a, a prediction of what a, a yo would emit over um, the day. So in terms of methane, our average dry yo will produce approximately 20 grams of methane per day. So let's put this into context. Let's compare it to a lactating dairy cow here in Ireland. She on average will produce approximately 240 grams per day. Or if we look at a finishing beef steer here in Ireland, they're producing approximately 230 grams per day. So you can see straight away, and it goes back to my first point uh, that I made, sheep aren't really the main culprit when it comes to methane emissions from the agricultural sector. Um, a cattle produce a lot more methane emissions compared to sheep. But if we express it a different way, and there's lots of ways to express methane, if we express methane per kilogram of live weight of the animal, 
we are seeing that there's very the result from the yo is very comparable to your dairy cow or your finishing steer. Um, so it really depends on how you're going to express this trait. So the next thing we want to do is well build up a profile of what does methane look look like across the life of the animal. And this is some work that my colleague Fiona McGovern has done here in Ireland, where she's looked at comparing the methane emissions across life stages on the same animals. So we have animals uh, measured as lambs, then hoggets, dry yews, and lactating yews. And as you can see, your methane output increases. Um, across, the, across these time points. What we wanted to do then is to link it to the intake of the animals. So we've actually measured feed intake of these animals mostly on uh, out at pasture. And you can see that there's a very similar trend between methane and intake. And that, that makes sense. We know that methane is highly uh, correlated or highly related to the intake of the animals. So if we can select for higher intake animals, we, we're automatically selecting uh, for methane. But there's lots of variation around that. And that's what my next slide looks at, is the genetics behind this methane. So is there actual variation between animals that eat the same amount or that weigh the same amount? Um, and that's really what we're interested in from the genetic evaluations or our indexes point of view. It's looking at, can we select animals that produce methane uh, for the same level of output productivity-wise? Productivity so to date, we have approximately 12,000 methane measurements um, taken right across uh, Ireland from both commercial and pedigree flocks here in Ireland. And so we've done some preliminary work, look, work from a genetic point of view where we looked at, well, is this trait heritable? So in other words, can we select genetically superior animals for reduced methane emissions? And the good news or the promising news so far is we, we are seeing that it's heritable. It's about 25% heritable. And what that means is that if you have two animals, the differences in the methane produced for these animals, 25% of that is due to the genetics of the animal. It's not down to diet, it's not down to breed, it's not down to the age of the animal, it's purely down to the genetic makeup of the animal. So at a heritability of 25%, it's pretty comparable to what we'd have for lamb liveweights here. So it means that we can make rapid genetic progress on a trait that's quite her highly heritable. The other good news from it is it's quite a repeatable trait as well. So it's about 40% repeatable. And again, that's really good news for us in that it tells us that if we measure an animal at, a, at an earlier stage in life, so be it a lamb, we have a good predictor of what the methane profile of that animal will be later on in life. So again, it allows us to build up a picture very quickly on these animals. So with genetics, I suppose the ultimate aim is to get to the breeding values, to, so to get our breeding values for methane. And this uh, graph here, it shows the breeding, what our breeding values would look like methane based on the records we have to date. So what I've done here in the blue box here, this is all, all animals that are measured, so about 12,000 animals. But then I've also looked at individual breeds. So Bior is the Belle Claire, we've looked at Charlie, we've looked at Texel, and we've looked at Suff. Book. And the first thing I suppose you'll notice is that the, the bars or the, the zero or the line here is pretty close together, which basically tells us that there's huge variation within every breed. No one breed is going to solve the methane emissions for the sheep industry here in Ireland. There's as much variation across breeds as there is within breeds. The other interesting thing when we look at this is the actual variation in our breeding values. So if you look at this blue, if you focus on the blue box here and focus on these uh, dots up here at the top, you can see that there's some animals producing approximately three, three to four grams more methane per day compared to the average, which is at zero. But then on the other end of the scale, you can see that there's animals down here producing almost five, four and five grams less methane per day compared to the average. So in, in terms of the scale, there's approximately eight grams difference between your, your uh, lowest emitter and your top emitter. So lots of variation there between animals that we can start to select for uh, at a genetic level. So our aim is to actually produce breeding values and to produce what we call here in Ireland a star rating for these animals so that our highest emitters would get a poor star rating, a one star rating, whereas our lowest emitters, the animals that are producing less methane compared to what we expect them to, will get a high star rating. They will be our five star animals. So the farmers can actually start to select for these animals um, at an individual level. So like I mentioned, 
this work is ongoing. These are preliminary results that we have to date. And really, our plan is to get as much measurement across as a diverse uh, population as, as possible. Like I said, these packs, the great, the beauty of these is that they are actually mobile. And we've spent a lot of time, or the technician Owen Dunn, who is in charge of the packs, has spent a lot of the summer measuring both on commercial flocks and on pedigree flocks right around Ireland to make sure that we get a, gene a good genetic profile of these animals. And this work will continue in conjunction with Sheep Ireland in the years ahead. The other thing that we're looking at closely here in Ireland is actually developing what we call a carbon sub-index. So within our genetic evaluations or within our indexes, we have a number of sub-indexes. So take our terminal index at the minute, we have a lambing sub-index, we have a growth sub-index, and we have a carcass sub-index. So that allows farmers to delve in more deeply than the overall index if they want to, tr want to look at specific traits. And how we actually form our, carbon, our, our terminal sub-index is we have the breeding values similarly to what I showed you for the methane, and we multiply that by what we call the economic values, so the economic worth we put on individual traits. So take an example here of days to slaughter. We have an economic value of minus 25 cent for every day that an animal um, an animal gets to slaughter quicker. So it costs a farmer 25 cent less per day to get that animal to slaughter as quick as possible. And what we do is we multiply that economic value by the breeding value, add them all up, and we get our, car uh, we get our overall ter terminal index. What we're looking at doing now is adding in a carbon sub-index where we add the carbon value to each of these breeding values. So again, take the example of days to slaughter, basically our growth rate here in Ireland. If a lamb is, is growing faster and gets to slaughter, slaughter earlier, he's obviously producing less carbon, so he will have a lower carbon value, and that will be rewarded within this carbon sub-index. So in other words, it's not only rewarding animals at the economic level, we'll also start rewarding animals that are producing the goods for us at the carbon level as well. This is something that's already implemented in our dairy breeding index here in Ireland, or it's about to be launched for the dairy breeding index. Um, so basically this was our economic breeding index for dairy cattle uh, prior to the introduction of, sorry, of the carbon, carbon sub-index. And now, now this is it here. And you can see here that approximately 15 to 16% of the weighting in our dairy index is now taken up by this carbon sub-index. So again, rewarding those animals that are producing um, producing product more efficiently at a reduced carbon footprint. So it's something we're thinking seriously about for introducing into the sheep indexes here in Ireland. So what's the next steps? Well, really the next step is to get this methane trait incorporated into our actual breeding indexes. So this here is an example of a sales catalogue that a farmer here in Ireland will, will, uh, will have available to them if they're going to a mart or they're going to an individual breeder to uh, select a ram uh, for, for, the, for the breeding season. So it gives lots of information here, date of birth, the breed, the sex of the animal, how it was born, if the animal has a, a parentage DNA, so is it is it genomically tested? What's the scrapey? Lots of information here on the back pedigree of the animal. But I suppose the crux of it here is the actual indexes. So like I said, we have two indexes here in Ireland. We have the replacement index and the terminal index and a star rating relative to these. And we also display what we call key traits for the for the farmer. So there's approximately 23 traits to go in to make our replacement index, but we only display a couple of the, these traits so that if a farmer wants to improve, for example, lamb survivability, they can select those, those rams, particularly on this. So in the future, what do we want to see? We want to see a methane breeding value displayed here as well, which will give the information to the farmer if, if they wish to select an animal that's producing all the goods in terms of the replacement or terminal index, but is also going to produce lower methane emissions for the whole Irish sector as well. So really to wrap up then, what are my take home messages? Well, methane measurements are underway in sheep. We have them now for approximately two to three years here in Ireland. We're not the only country in the world. I know New Zealand, Australia, uh, France, Netherlands, etc., have lots of um, it, lots of measurements underway as well in sheep, and I know the UK are, are, are moving into this field as well. 
We focused on measuring both our commercial flocks and pedigree flocks to give us a very good profile of what methane looks across the entire uh, sheep industry here in Ireland. From a genetic point of view, the results are looking very promising. It is under genetic control. It means that we can select those uh, low emitters. But I suppose the important thing is not to lose sight of the fact that we don't just want a, sh a sheep that's producing uh, low methane, but not ticking the boxes for everything else. So we need to link it to the other production traits to make sure we're selecting animals that have produced methane, but also high proliferacy, high growth rates, good health, etc. So yeah, so in the future, we want to breed these low emitters, but also maintain our high levels of performance. And the goal is by 2023 or 2024 to have this information incorporated into our two national indexes, the terminal and the replacement index here in Ireland. So with that, I'll um, hand back and thank you very much um, to the funders of this research. Thank you very much, Noreen. Um, that was a really interesting presentation. And thank you, Laura, for your presentation earlier as well. Um, we have a couple of questions in, but we could do with some more. So please do uh, enter them into the question box um, and we can cover them now. Um, so first question is for Noreen. Um, if the major cause of methane is inefficiency of converting grass in the rumen, is there scope to ensure our pastures help maximise efficiency of what is eaten? What is the scope for condensed tannins in pasture species such as chicory and bird's foot trefoil to reduce methane output? Yes, yeah, so there's a, there's a good bit of work underway in this uh, area in Chagas Atenray as well with my colleagues uh, Fiona McGovern and Philip Creighton. Um, and they're looking at different multi-species or companion forages um, in the grass as well. Um, now, they haven't looked at those specific ones, but in general, what they're seeing is that if you if you have a multi-species, you definitely do reduce the methane emissions uh, for, from individual animals. So they're looking at the at now the composition of those multi-species or those companion forage to see what is the optimum. But there really is promising results there that show that we can reduce um, our methane emissions by adding in these companion forages as well. Thank you. Um, another question, uh, what proportion of the commercial flock in Ireland are using performance recorded rams? Yeah, so it, it, it's pretty hard to get a, a, a an accurate figure on it. Um, Sheep Ireland would say it's somewhere between 40 and 50%. Um, at the minute, most of the rams that are recorded or all the rams that are recorded in Ireland uh, are pedigree registered um, uh, through breed societies. So, you know, we are missing those um, scrub or scrub like rams um, or non pedigree recorded rams and um, they're not being recorded on the system at the minute. So we estimate roughly about between 40 and 50 percent. Next question. Um, how can you improve? Um, sorry, it's just gone up then. <laughs> how can you improve for hard hill flocks that only produce one lamb per year? It'll be the same process again, Laura. Um, so there'll be lots of variation between those um, hill lambs um, or those hill yos, whichever we measure. Um, we will see variation between them. Um, and again, it's to improve the methane emissions, but to keep in mind also the productivity of those. But like any other trait when it comes to genetics, we're going to see variation irrespective of what breed or what environment they're they're in um, and basically it's to select the best for that environment that we will focus on. Um, where is the UK compared to Ireland on this? Do you know? <laughs> Yeah, so so the UK, we are involved um, in, in projects with the UK, including the Eronet gra Grass to Gas um, project that will be spoken at uh, by, I think it's Nicola Lamb at the Sheep Breeders. So the UK are, um, they have done a lot of work, I suppose, on the CT side of things and looking at the differences in the room and size. Um, and is that linked to methane emissions? I suppose the next step, and I, I know there is talks about getting these packed chambers within the UK as well, so that you can, you know, you can start measuring a large number of animals quickly as well and, and gain ground very quickly. 
Thank you. Um, is or can methane be measured by PACs of different types of forage as well as grass? Yeah, so, so yeah, we, we like I said, in Chagas and Rai, we put animals through that have been on multi-species um, or different companion forages with, with gra in, including grass. So yeah, no issue measuring um, methane um, through whatever, whatever way the animal have fed. It's the same indoors, we've measured animals um, on concentrate on silage based diet and you know really when it comes to the packs it's a ranking tool it's about you know selecting the animals that are the highest emitters versus the low emitters on that specific day on that specific diet and that's what we need for genetics so it's a very very useful tool for that um, are relationships with animal health being examined i.e fec and methane production yeah, definitely. That's that's now we haven't done it to date, but that's that's definitely part of of the the next bit of the of the jigsaw for us. We have the methane now. Now we want to link it to all the other performance traits and health traits as well. So, yeah, we want to make sure that you know we're not just selecting for methane, but having a negative impact on some other aspect um, of health or production. So, yeah, that's definitely something the the next bit of the jigsaw for us. Um. One of your tables it showed genetic variation for methane. Uh, Texel will look to have greater variation. So, are they key to provide the solution? I would say no. It, it, like any trade, you know, you will have some breeds that will excel slightly over others. But when it comes to it, we don't say select on an individual breed. We say select on the best animal within that breed for that specific trait. So I don't think it's going to come down to one specific breed to solve this issue. It's basically selecting the best in whichever breed we select on. Great. Got a good question here. Um, a bit of a wider question. You say many flocks are using five star rams. How do we get pedigree and commercial breeders in the UK to want to use these figures? Yeah, I suppose it, it, it like ourselves, it can be a slow burning uh, process. A lot of what I do and Sheep Ireland do as well is to prove that these work first of all to to both pedigree and commercial breeders. So it's it's like what I've shown there. Well, what is the difference between a selecting a five star and a one star? And we have trials on the on the ground in Chaga Satin Rai looking at this constantly. We use the national database. So it's really hammering home that you know selecting these animals will improve your performance. Um, and I think, you know, it's coming then from the commercial farmer to, you know, seeing that, yeah, look, this this will lift, you know, performance for me and for them demanding them then off the pedigree for, pedigree breeder as well that, you know, when I go in to select my rams this year, you know, have you indexes to back these up so I'm not just selecting on physical appearance. Obviously, physical appearance is obviously important, but you know that there are some figures around that. So the the classic example I give is you know milk yield or proliferacy. How do you know what a what a ram's potential is for that for his daughters based on looking at the ram? We have no idea. For growth, obviously, we can and carcass characteristics we can assess that based on looking at the ram. But those hard to measure traits, we really need breeding values to help it. So again, it's 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 really about educating and showing the benefit of it for commercial and pedigree breeders. Will be. Um, is methane emission EBVs strongly correlated to other EBVs? Um, if so, what direction would you say that would be? Yeah, so we're, we're early on looking at, at that, but we are seeing that it would be, we are seeing that it is strongly correlated with our growth rates. So higher growth on average, you would see higher methane because those animals are potentially eating more. But again, from genetics basis, we're always looking at those core ben benders. So the animals, you know, that are growing fast, producing less methane, and that's what our index will take into account. It will take into account these fast growing animals that also produce less methane. Lovely. Um, how do UK slash signet figures compare with the island uptake of recorded flocks? Do you, are yeah. you able to answer that? <laughs> so we've done we've done some preliminary work um, with with yourselves and with uh, SRUC on this. It was uh, specifically to uh, Suffolk and Texel because we just had the most you know the largest number of common um, of common animals between both countries. 
and we focused on specifically on the growth traits and lambing um, and we saw that there was strong correlations between uh, the figures that are presented by Signet versus the pr figures that are um, displayed by Sheep Ireland. So again, that's a positive showing that, you know, your animals on average that rank well in UK will not rank well in Ireland or vice versa. But there's lots more work we can do in that in the future. But yeah, our initial work, work is looking very promising on that. Really, I think um, this one's probably more of a comment than a question. Um, we need them, I think farmers, to start using figures for overall selection before we can get them to select for rams with lower carbon figures. Absolutely, really absolutely. And I, and I mean, that's that's why we select, you know, we have the overall terminal or the overall replacement index because on average that will bring you in the right direction for your terminal traits or your replacement traits. And, you know, a farmer who doesn't want on individual traits that's absolutely fine because on average if you're selecting those animals on the overall index they're going to tick the box on average on most of these traits and that's the exact same with methane it's going to be hidden for most farmers who don't want to select in that they just want to improve the productivity or the profitability they can continue to select on that overall index but methane is just there in the background you know and we're making sure that we're breeding those animals that are producing less methane but improving performance um, what is the approximate cost of putting a sheep through a gas chamber versus a PAC unit? Wow, yeah, um, good question. We haven't, I suppose, done it up. Uh, the biggest biggest cost, I suppose, for us is labour. You know, when you look at your uh, respiration chamber, the animal is in there for 48 hours. So each animal is in there for 48 hours versus the pack, they're in there for 50 minute uh, period. We haven't put specific costs, but I'm going to say it's going to be five, six times the cost, um, you know, putting an animal through a respiration chamber, feeding them for that 48 hours versus, you know, OK, there's a cost of hauling your your chambers around to individual flocks. But, you know, once you're set up, you can be set up for the there for the day and measure, you know, 72, uh, 84 animals, etc. Um, is there a need to select for both positive fat and positive muscle to ensure lambs are easily finished from pasture with minimal concentrates? Yeah, um, so again, it's it's part of our indexes and the UK indexes. Um, the fat one is one we, we grapple with. It really depends on the production system. So we don't actually at the minute give a positive or negative rating for the fat um, cover. We don't say what's a five star versus a one star because it really depends uh, on your production system, you know, a, a grass based versus, you know, a concentrated or creep fed system. We basically produce the breeding value. And I suppose it's up to you to look at, you know, where you want to get to. Do you want to get more fat on your lambs or do you want to get your lambs um, leaner? So it, the value is there for, for farmers to, to select uh, based on that themselves. Um, do animals on different diets rank the same? Yeah, so that's something we're very conscious of and we've a lot of work done in the background on that, you know, do animals rank the same throughout the day? Do animals rank the same um, across days? And do they rank the same yet yeah, across diets? And really our results are very, are, are showing that animals are pretty consistent, you know, across these things, which again is giving us a lot more uh, faith in, in the pack chambers. And as well, one of the first experiments we did is we we put a series of lambs through our respiration chambers in conjunction with AFI in Northern Ireland. And we also uh, put them through the pack chambers to make sure that animals are ranking the same on the gold standard, those respiration chambers where they go in for 48 hours versus our pack measurements, which is 50 minutes. And again, we saw that it's pretty consistent ranking, which again is, is, is what we wanted to hear um, in terms of our packs. Um, uh, this question, I'm not sure. Um, I think it means directly from the sheep. But, um, has anyone pulled together a pie chart showing all the components that affect sheep emissions? Um, yeah, so if you, well, I suppose one of my first slides looked at what's the breakdown on, on an av national average, you know, where are her total em emissions coming from it you know is it manure is it land management that can be assigned to individual yos is it the methane emissions nitrous oxide so yeah there is a lot of modeling done in that to show what is the specific breakdown um of your emissions your total greenhouse gas emissions uh from an individual flock or an individual animal i think that's what that person was asking okay um 
this, um, well, maybe a comment and a question. Um, it would seem likely that the SF6 measurements on flock animals are likely to be more representative of real life than one animal in isolation for 48 hours. Can you take account of this? Yeah, I suppose that's the beauty of genetics. Um, you know, if you think about it, even think of something like live weight. We know there's lots of different management across different flocks and genetics takes account into that, of that. It takes out all those environmental aspects. So if really to start with, when we talk about genetics, it ranks within a flock. So it, who are the best animals within that flock versus the lowest animals? And then when we talk about genetics, it's all about, you know, that family tree. So is there a sire used in this flock, which is, ver which is a very different management to another specific flock and how do they rank across those two systems so it's the same principle here when it comes to measuring methane across different um, equipment it's how does that sire's sire's progeny rank on the sf6 compared to ones that were put into the into the um, respiration chamber and we're taking out those environmental effects and look looking specifically at the ranking for methane a good question yeah yeah, that's good. Um, this might be our last question today. Um, is the emissions intensity, uh, intensity an important metric as it takes into account production rather than just using gross emissions as a measure? Absolutely, yes, yes, because we want those animals that are, are, are very efficient on our system, you know, are ticking all the boxes in terms of production um, as well as reduced emissions. So yes, absolutely. But unfortunately, when it comes to uh, you know what um, what what we have to do here in Ireland in terms of reducing emissions, it's on a total basis. So that's why we need to measure absolute emissions, but also not take um, not lose sight of emissions per yeah kilogram of product or whatever the efficiency measure we put on them. Thank you, Noreen. I think that was a really good um, group of questions we had there, and um, I think you answered them fantastically so thank you very much um, for that um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today um, before you all go I'd just like to draw your attention to our online delivering the future of farming event on Thursday the 10th of November um, details for your sector are on this slide here um, and you can book onto this event uh, via our website um, thank you very much again for everyone who's joined us on the webinar today and for Noirin and for Laura for speaking. Um, I think we hope you'll agree it's been a really informative, interesting webinar. Uh, please, if you don't agree or if you do agree, um, please leave us your feedback. Um, we would really like to just keep improving these webinars for the future. And uh, thank you very much. Goodbye.